You guys, we made it to the end. This is the seventh one of Chapter 7. We've done it. Piaget versus Vygotsky. Okay, so this, we've talked about Piaget's theory. We've talked about Vygotsky's theory. Um, now we're going to directly compare them. We did that a little bit in the, um, the sixth video, um, but we're going to do it more overtly here. So, on language and thought, Piaget said that verbal reflection was, um, that verbal ability was a really a reflection of the individual's understanding, and so their conceptual understanding of what was going on. Um, so, he said that language kind of came, was just a direct reflection of um, the mental processes that was going on. He said that language was a way to kind of speed up thinking. Um, he said that it allowed thinking to be more organized and it would speed it up. Um, and he, again, he was saying that cognition determines language, um, that the thought comes first and the language comes after. Um, he said this was evident by egocentric speech um, and those collective monologues um, that your book discusses and that we've discussed already. Vygotsky said um, that language allows for higher mental functions. So Vygotsky saw language kind of as a tool. Um, and remember, Vygotsky was big on tools. So Vygotsky kind of saw language as a tool. Um, he says that language precedes thought. Okay, so again, this is backwards. Um, Piaget says cognition first, then language. Vygotsky says language first, then thought. Um, and he said this was due to evidence such as private speech. Um, private speech is when you are working on something yourself and you're talking to yourself and you're trying to figure it out. Um, my daughter does it when she's doing a math problem. She'll take her hands, she'll put them in her lap, uh, and she'll kind of um, not even really talk out loud, kind of just a little bit. You can hear the mumbling and she's doing the math problem in her, in her head with her fingers, and then she comes up with the answer. Um, and so again, he's saying that this is, this is indicative that language is really preceding thought, that they're using language as a tool to let them do these higher mental processes. Um, and he says that this is really coming through, that they're, they're learning language um, and self-regulation is coming through these social interactions, which is, again, no surprise from Vygotsky um, because he is from this social cultural perspective. Um, he's saying that pretty much everything we do comes from this social interaction. Both of which, uh, Piaget and Vygotsky, both influenced education. Um, Piaget was really great for discovery learning. Um, he, that was one of his kind of hallmark things. Remember, he viewed them as children as little scientists. Um, and that's what discovery learning is, is you're given these things and you're supposed to find out the answer. Um, his um, ideas also influenced kind of the readiness to learn when children are developmentally ready to learn different things um, comes out of Piaget's theory. Um, it's very similar to kind of the stages. Um, they're obviously very different, um, but it's still um, an impact Piaget had. He also, the motivation to learn is coming out of this. Um, again, that investigative, um, that little scientist, um, that motivation to learn is um, a perspective that we're getting from Piaget in our modern education. Um, he was also pretty good about the sensitivity to individual differences. And so the differences that we see in learning styles and the differences that we see in kind of where children are um, is reflective of Piaget's theory. Activity centers, huge in kindergarten last year for my daughter. Um, still um, very big in first grade, um, but kind of having a center where there's one particular activity and then you're supposed to work through that problem. Um, that, again, is very Piagetian. Um, and the evaluation of self um, compared to previous performances. Um, technically, that's what we're doing when we're grading students. We're not comparing you to other students. We're comparing you to kind of your own performance. Um, we're comparing you to kind of this metric. Um, and so again, um, and, and the idea that you're supposed to, if you got a 73 on one test and a 78 on the next test, you should be happy because that 78 is an improvement compared to previous uh, performances. Again, so again, this evaluation of yourself that way is coming out of Piaget. Vygotsky, um, again, we talked about how much education loves Vygotsky. So the whole idea of scaffolding, um, which if you're familiar with anything education-based is huge, comes from Vygotsky. So he had a really, really major um, impact. Cooperative learning, so the whole working in groups idea, Vygotsky. Um, again, this is, he had a really, really big impact 
um, on education. Assisted discovery. Um, so this is still discovery looking, learning, but it's kind of with some extra supports in place, with some scaffolds in place. Um, and again, this is coming out of Vygotsky. Um, and again, the importance of this social interaction with peers as a tool for learning, um, that we can learn more when we're talking and working through these problems with others. I even in my own classes suggest that. Um, you know, in the study guides, I say, hey, find someone you can talk about these ideas to. You can talk about these things with. It's a study partner from the class, great. It's a loving someone else who's willing to listen to you talk about developmental psychology, great. But that interaction with peers really helps you learn um, the material. And so even in my own class, it's that reflection of the influence of Vygotsky. Peer learning. Um, Piaget said um, that there was kind of a socio-cognitive conflict, and this is that idea um, that there's opportunity for cognitive growth through conflict of ideas through social interaction. So you're working on a problem and your partner's, you're, somebody else is working on a problem and you went about solving that problem in different ways. Um, and that this, by seeing this different interaction, that's an opportunity for you um, to kind of gain cognitive skills um, by looking at it from this other perspective. He's not saying that this social interaction is really pushing learning. Um, he's really saying um, that it's the ability to kind of see that someone's argument may be more logical than yours um, is an opportunity um, for refined cognitive skills. PJ also said um, that this cognitive growth really stems from the recognition of the social cognitive conflict, that, that different views and one idea may be more logical than others, okay? He didn't have a lot to say about peers. Um, he talked about them a little bit here. Um, he talked about it a little bit with peer learning um, and that... Um, that there are differences with novels and experts, um, but he didn't focus on peers the way Vygotsky did. Um, Vygotsky, peer collaboration was huge. Um, this was a really big thing for him. He said this was best done when peers were really equally matched in terms of peer collaboration um, and that both of them would kind of reach higher levels because of that um, cooperative um, learning that was taking place in this peer collaboration. He also talked about intersubjectivity um, and this is that again that commitment to finding common ground, to finding that same perspective. Um, and again, that this was an opportunity for further learning as well, which is very similar to Piaget's sociocognitive conflict. Um, that again, this kind of working on building a common ground. The difference is, is Piaget is looking at it from the perspective of an individual, because um, Piaget was interested in the individual. That's why he contributed all those things about individual differences. But Vygotsky's looking at both of them working together. Um, so he's looking at it from that perspective of the interaction more than he is looking at it from the perspective of the individual. Okay, so here's a video I want you guys to watch um, talking about um, both Piaget and Vygotsky um, in terms of um, kind of their theories and their overarching um, words. Piaget starts out with the child as an independent learner. Vygotsky starts out with the child as a dependent learner, moving to independence at a second stage. Then the question arises, well, who is right, Vygotsky or Piaget? I would say they're both right. That which, which kind of learning takes place um, is a question of the culture. And even within a culture, it's a question of the task. I think that you're more likely to see Piagetian uh, discovery where the consequences of errors are not life-threatening, are not serious. You're more likely to see uh, Vygotskyan scaffolding where the consequences of errors are life-threatening. You and Mommy are going to cross the street, and I want you to keep a hold of my hand, and I don't want you to run out in front of me. We have to look both ways before We're we not going to let the child learn about the danger of being run over through trial and error. There's going to be a lot of scaffolding, a lot of help. We're going to be darn sure that the child has internalized the rules before we let the child do it by themselves. So in that situation, Vygotsky um, presents a more accurate view of the learning process in uh, something like imaginative play.
where there are no consequences because it's all fantasy of mistakes, we're going to allow plenty of trial and error, uh, plenty of discovery. Okay, so the, I want to end this conversation of Piaget and Vygotsky um, with quotes from each of the individual um, and then start getting you thinking um, towards chapter 9 when we're going to talk about schooling and education. Okay, so Vygotsky. Um, what would Lev Vygotsky think? He wrote, in play, a child always behaves beyond his average age, above his daily behavior. In play, it is as though he were a head taller than himself. What would Vygotsky think about early education settings that really don't emphasize play? We'll talk about this in chapter 9, that we see this kind of push towards academic-based preschools, touch towards academics earlier and earlier and earlier, um, and a de-emphasis on play. What would Vygotsky think um, about the curriculums that leave children feeling a head smaller than themselves? We have all have gone through the educational system and we have all had time periods where, where it broke us down and we felt terrible. Um, there was, doesn't matter how, if it was just one time, it doesn't matter if it was many times. Um, what, what would he say about that? Um, that again, that we've have this situation um, where instead of seeing what we can do well um, and seeing that we can achieve higher goals um, that we feel that we're really trapped at a lower level. Um, so again, I just want you to kind of think through uh, Vygotsky and think about this quote and think about um, what, what, what you think he would think about these, what you think he would say. Um, and again, this is getting you also thinking towards Chapter 9 when we talk about um, education, since both of them um, are influential on our educational system. What would Piaget think? He wrote, the principal goal of education is to create men who are capable of doing new things, not simply of repeating what other generations have done. Men, men that are creative, inventive, and discoverers. Now let's first of all take the gender out of this. Let's say that he's talking about people in general, which I think he really is. Um, but what would he say um, about a pre-K to college factory model system that is more concerned with rote learning than creativity, inventiveness, and discoveries? Um, we really, the multiple choice test is not about creative, inventive discovery. The multiple choice test, which we are, have all been taking, um, my daughter has multiple choice quizzes on, um, some of these online learning platforms. Um, in kindergarten, she had them. When you only have one right answer, how does that promote creativity, inventiveness, discovery? How does that promote this individual learning? Um, and so again, what would he think of this model where there's only one right answer all the time? Um, and because we don't invent if there's only one right answer. If this is the way it is and this is the way it's supposed to be, um, and there's only one right answer, then we don't have that opportunity for inventiveness. Um, so what would he think about that? So again, I just want you to kind of think about what we have learned about Piaget and Vygotsky, think about these quotes, um, and think about, think towards chapter nine when we're going to be talking um, about education specifically. So this ends our discussion of Piaget and Vygotsky. Thanks.